what we're going to be talking about today is how to deal with general RLC circuits or second order circuits that don't fit in um, the subset of parallel RLC circuits, which we discussed about a week ago, uh, and series RLC circuits, which I believe we discussed last Friday. So this is going to be the transient analysis. of general RLC circuits. And we are going to revisit, or actually let me call this general second order circuits. And um, as I was saying a moment ago, we're going to revisit series RLC and parallel RLC to see if we can glean any information, right? So uh, let's look at a parallel RLC over here on the left. Where we would have a simple system. Um, let's make this. Let's see, let's put a short circuit here. Current source here. Brace. Having uh, stylus issues, please give me a moment. And the battery, we should be good to go now. Um, so I'm just simply drawing a parallel RLC circuit. Where this is R, L, and C. This is I, R, I, L, and I, C. And our voltage drop, V of T, is the voltage drop across any of these elements connected in parallel. Um, let's see, so using Kirchhoff's current law at that top node, we're going to have IR, which is just V of T over R um, plus IL, which is going to look like one over L times the integral from T naught to T of V of T prime DT um, plus, excuse me, um, I L at T naught plus C D V by D T is equal to zero. And taking the derivative uh, of both sides will get us to a second order differential equation. And I'm gonna go ahead and divide everything through by C as well in a single step. 
um, so that we're going to have the second derivative of the voltage with respect to time plus one over RC times the first derivative of the voltage with respect to time plus one over LC times the zeroth derivative with respect to time is equal to zero. Okay. Um, we've already got done something like this before. Um, for a parallel RLC circuit, we know that alpha is simply one over twice RC. We derive this and we know that, uh, let me move this over a smidge. Omega naught is equal to the square root of one over LC. Well, if we look at the coefficients of this second order differential equation, I'm gonna call this coefficient, the coefficient of the first derivative term B, and I'm gonna call the coefficient of the zeroth derivative term C. We can see that alpha is nothing more than B over two, and omega naught is nothing more than the square root of lowercase c. If we were to look at a series RLC circuit, we'll actually see something incredibly similar. So for a series RLC circuit, I might have something like this, where I have a voltage source Vs tied to a switch. That switch could open or close at t is equal to zero. Here's my resistor, inductor, capacitor, my current I of t, and this would be then Vc, Vr, and VL. Writing a KVL equation around that loop during the transient condition, I'm going to have the voltage drop over the resistor, um, which is R times I plus the voltage drop over the inductor, which is L di by dt plus the voltage drop across the capacitor, which is 1 over C integral from T naught to T of I of T prime, dt prime, plus Vc at T naught is equal to zero. Once again, taking the derivative with respect uh, on both sides with respect to time and moving um, the L into the denominator, we are going to wind up getting the second derivative of the current with respect to time plus R over L times the first derivative of the current with respect to time plus one over LC um, times the zeroth derivative of the current with respect to time is equal to zero. We have a second order differential equation. We found that alpha was equal to R over two L and omega naught was once again equal to one over LC. Looking at the coefficients of our second order differential equation, where this one will be lowercase b, and this one will be lowercase c, we can see that alpha is nothing more than once again b over two, and omega naught is the square root of lowercase c. So it looks like if we are able to write a second order differential equation of this particular form, um, where the coefficient of the second derivative term is one, then um, whatever the coefficient of our first derivative term is multiplied by one half will give us alpha. And whatever the coefficient of our zeroth derivative term is, uh, if we take the square root of that, we will be able to get omega naught. So let's see how this works for a general RLC circuit.
So for these type of problems, the hardest part is literally going to be writing our, or coming up with our second order differential equation. Um, so let's look at this circuit here. We are going to have a switch that is closing at T is equal to zero. I'm going to call this resistor R2. We're going to work with numbers here in a little bit, um, but as you'll likely see and hopefully agree with here in a moment, um, working with all of these quantities symbolically is actually going to be a little bit easier to do um, from the jump since we have to write this equation. And then we'll um, add in the numbers at the end. So here is C. Um, let's define some things here really quickly. This is VC of T, uh, which means this is IC of T. Over here, we will have VL of T, and that would make this current IL of T. Um, these are, for the most part, the four quantities that we are going to have to solve for in order to um, come up with the response for this thing. So in a series RLC circuit, our current I was common to everything. In a parallel RLC circuit, our voltage V was common to everything because this circuit is neither a parallel RLC circuit or a series RLC circuit, we won't see that any of these quantities are common to all of our elements. So we have to pay attention to both the inductor uh, voltage and current and the capacitor voltage and current. Um, hopefully we can all see that this is not a parallel RLC circuit. The easiest way that I can see that it isn't a parallel RLC circuit uh, is during the transient condition, I'm going to have R1 in parallel with L in series with R3 in parallel with C, right? So since we have that branch containing L in series with R3 uh, in our parallel combination, this is not a strictly parallel RLC circuit. All right, so how do we come up with an expression? Uh, or our second order differential equation. Uh, there are multiple different ways to do this. I am going to show you the way that makes the most sense to me. Um, you could technically also do things like nodal analysis and mesh analysis here, uh, but I find that doing nodal and mesh while also doing calculus uh, can be a little bit difficult. So that's why I'm choosing to use the method that I'm using. All right, so uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write a Kirchhoff's current law equation at this node, right? Uh, so I'm going to say that the current flowing in, I'm going to define that here. So this is my current flowing in, and I'm just going to call it IR1 of T will be equal to my two currents flowing out. And I'm going to express um, I R1 of T um, as the voltage drop over R1 divided by the resistance of R1. Okay. So effectively what I'm doing here is I'm kind of treating this bottom node as ground. So the voltage drop on the bottom of R1 is Vs, and the voltage um, with respect to ground at the top of R1 will actually be Vc. 
because when our switch is closed, the resistance R2 is completely bypassed by that top short circuit, okay? So the voltage drop over R1 is Vs minus Vc. I divide this by R1, and this whole quantity represents my current. And this is going to be equal to IL plus IC. So the current flowing into that node is equal to the currents flowing out of that node. Um, what I'm going to do now is I am going to rearrange some things here. Um, so the first thing I can do is I can express IC in terms of um, our voltage, our capacitor voltage. So that's going to give me Vs divided by R1 minus Vc of T divided by R1 is equal to IL of T plus C EVC by DT. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to isolate IL of T on one side of the equation. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do that by simply subtracting the C dV by dt term out so that I will get IL of t is equal to Vs divided by R1 minus Vc divided by R1 minus C dV by dt. Right? So this is going to be my first equation. For my second equation, I am going to write effectively a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around that right-hand loop. Um, so I can see by inspection that Vc of t is going to be equal to the voltage drop across my inductor, Vl of t. plus the voltage drop across that resistor R3, um, which is just going to be R3 times IL of T. And so what I am going to do now is I'm going to express um, VL of T in terms of my current IL of T. So that's going to give me Vc is equal to L dil by dt plus R3 times IL of t. And this is my second equation. So now I need to make a choice, and this choice is completely and utterly arbitrary. Um, I have to decide whether or not uh, I'm going to take the derivative of equation one with respect to time to figure out what the derivative of IL with respect to time looks like, or I need to figure out if I'm going to take the derivative of equation two um, to figure out what the derivative of the capacitor voltage with respect to time looks like, because I'm going to wind up substituting um, relationship one into relationship two or relationship two into relationship one. And it literally doesn't matter which one I choose to do here. Um, so I am going to take the derivative of my inductor current. Okay. So D I L by D T uh, so the derivative of Vs over R1 is 
zero. So nothing there. Uh, the derivative of negative VC divided by R1 is going to look like negative one over R1 times, excuse me, DVC by DT. And the derivative of that third term in equation one is going to look like negative C times the second derivative. of VC with respect to time. And I'm gonna call this equation three. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to substitute equation one and equation three into equation two. So that's going to give me VC of T is equal to L times DI L by DT. So here's L. Now I'm going to substitute in equation three. So that's going to look like negative one over R1 times the derivative of the capacitor voltage with respect to time minus C times the second derivative of the capacitor voltage with respect to time. Um, plus R3 times IL, where IL is defined in equation one. So that's gonna be VS over R1 minus VC over R1 minus C dV by dt. And now I have everything in terms of my capacitor voltage, which is fantastic because I'm looking for a second order differential equation, either in terms of my capacitor voltage or my inductor current. Um, so now I'm just going to distribute that L outside of the brackets, uh, distribute that R3 that's outside of the brackets, and then move all of my VC terms to the left-hand side of the right side, right? I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging as well. So I'm going to put my second derivative term first. So I'm going to have the second derivative of my capacitor voltage with respect to time here. And I can see that there's going to be a factor of L times C out front. And this is going to be positive when I move it to the left-hand side of the equal sign. So I'm just going to make a little note here that I've taken this term into account. Uh, now I'm going to do my first derivative terms. So I have, let me put this over here. I have a, let's see, um, I'm going to have an L over R1 term. From this part. And I'm going to have an R3 times C term. From this bit right here. And those are all my first derivative terms. Now I'm going to look at my zeroth derivative terms. Um, so that's going to just be R3 over R1 times VC. So that is this term right here. Actually, I missed something. Um, I'm also going to have a plus one from this term here. So let me fix that.
And then finally, I have that constant term, uh, which I'm leaving on the right-hand side of the equal sign, so that sign isn't going to change. So it's just going to be R3 divided by R1 times Vs. The last thing I'm going to do now is simply move that LC term. Um, I'm going to divide through by LC on both sides effectively to get the coefficient of my second derivative term to be one. So that is going to leave me with the second derivative of my capacitor voltage with respect time plus L over R1 plus R3 times C divided by LC times the first derivative with respect to time plus R3 over R1 plus one divided by LC times VC is equal to R3 over R1 LC times our source voltage. And we now have this in the form that we want. So looking at this differential equation, we can see that alpha is just going to be one half times one over R1 plus R3C divided by LC and omega naught is going to be the square root of R3 over R1 plus one divided by LC. So we've solved for alpha and omega naught. And from here, this problem would be exactly the same as any other problem that we have worked. We would analyze the circuit at, excuse me, uh, we can use alpha and omega naught to determine if the circuit is overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped. Uh, that lets us know what type of response it has. We can analyze the circuit at t is equal to zero minus, t is equal to zero plus, and t is equal to infinity to figure out where to plug things in, uh, and so forth. So let's scroll up here and define some quantities, okay? So let's say that R1 was equal to 10 ohms. R2 is equal to six ohms. The value of this resistor doesn't actually matter as long as it's not zero. R3 is equal to four ohms. Uh, let's say that our inductor is a two Henry inductor. Our capacitor is a 0 0.2 farad capacitance. And our source voltage is 24 volts. So using these parameters, what we would find is that alpha comes out to be 1.25 per second or nepers per second, and omega naught comes out to be 1.871 radians per second, since alpha is less than omega naught, this circuit is an example of an underdamped circuit which means we're gonna to need to calculate a quantity omega D, where omega D is simply the square root of omega naught squared minus alpha squared. So give me just a moment to determine what that's gonna be.
Uh, so I get 1.392. radians per second. And now let's get into the normal part of our analysis, right? Let's analyze the circuit at t is equal to zero minus. So at t at e, uh, is equal to zero minus, our switch is open. Um, so I'm just not gonna draw the switch part of the circuit at all because it's just an open circuit. So here's my resistor R1, which was 10 ohms. Here's my 24 volt source. Here's my resistor R2, um, which is six ohms. Then I have my inductor, which is gonna look like a short circuit at T is equal to zero minus. Um, here is the voltage drop across my inductor, VL at zero minus. Here is the current flowing through my inductor, IL at zero minus. Here I have my resistor R3, which has a value of four ohms. Then over here, I have my capacitor, which is going to look like an open circuit at T is equal to zero minus. Here is my voltage VC at zero minus. And here is my current IC at zero minus. Um, so I'm just gonna put some things over here. So this is where we're gonna put VC at zero minus when we figure that out. Here's IC at zero minus. By inspection, we know that this must be zero amps. Here's where we're gonna put VL at zero minus. By inspection, this is zero volts. Here's where we're gonna put IL at zero minus. So um, I am going to use Ohm's law to find IL at zero minus. So to me, that looks like 24 volts divided by 10 plus six plus four. Uh, so that's 20 ohms. So 24 over 20 um, is 2.4 over 2, or 1.2 amps, if my mental math is correct. Um, 1.2 amps multiplied by 4 ohms is going to give us a voltage of 4.8 volts for VC at 0 minus. Actually, let me go ahead and write out the Ohm's law relationship there just so everybody knows exactly what I'm doing. We could have also done voltage division to find um, the voltage drop across the four ohm resistor, which is the same thing as the voltage drop over the capacitor first, and then used Ohm's law to find um, the current simply by dividing that voltage by four. All right, so here's our analysis at T is equal to zero minus, fairly straightforward. Now let's look at what's going on at T is equal to zero plus. So at T is equal to zero plus, um, our switch is bypassing our six ohm resistor. So I'm just gonna replace that six ohm resistor with a short circuit. Um, so here is my 10 ohm resistor. Here's my 24 volt source, shorting out my six ohm resistor because the switch shorts it out. Uh, my inductor is going to look like a 1.2 amp current source direction down. This is the voltage drop across my inductor at T is equal to zero plus. Here is my resistor R3, which has a value of four ohms. Um, let's see, my capacitor is going to look like a 4.8 volt voltage source.
and this is my capacitor current IC at zero plus. There we go. So once again, I'm going to write down the quantities that we're trying to find. So starting with VC, since the voltage drop across a capacitor cannot change abruptly, if it was zero, or excuse me, if it was 4.8 volts at zero minus, it must still be 4.8 volts at zero plus. Um, we'll figure out what IC at zero plus is going to be here in a moment. Um, the L at zero plus, we're also going to have to figure that out here in a moment. Um, IL at zero plus must be 1.2 amps because that's what value the current add at T is equal to zero minus. All right, so um, just looking at a couple of things here, I know that 1.2 amps is flowing through the four ohm resistor, which means this voltage is 4.8 volts. So if I did a Kirchhoff's voltage law uh, equation around the right-hand side of this circuit, I can easily see that VL must be zero volts because negative 4.8 uh, minus VL plus 4.8 equals to zero means that VL has to be zero. So that is fairly straightforward. Um, to find IC, I can figure out what this current is. So the current flowing through my 10 ohm resistor here. Um, is going to be 24 minus 4.8 over 10. Let me throw that in a calculator really quickly because I can't do that in my head. So that looks like 1.92 amps to me. Um, so IC is going to be that 1.92 amps minus 1.2 amps. Using Kirchhoff's current law at this middle node, the current flowing in 1.92 is equal to 1.2 plus IC. Rearranging things, so minus 1.2. I'm going to get 0 0.72 amps. And now we have all four quantities at T is equal to zero plus. Again, nothing wildly difficult here. Uh, so let's analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity. So we are gonna have our 10 ohm resistor in series with our 24 volt source. Our six ohm resistor is still shorted. Our inductor is now going to look like a short circuit over which we will have the voltage drop VL at infinity. Um, and here is our current IL at infinity. Down here we have our four ohm resistor. And then over here is our capacitor, which is going to look like an open circuit because we're at DC steady state at T is equal to infinity. So here is VC at infinity. Here is IC at infinity. And let's go over here. So VC at infinity, we're gonna solve for, I'm gonna use voltage division this time. IC at infinity is zero amps by inspection. VL at infinity is zero volts by inspection. IL at infinity, I'm gonna solve for using Ohm's law. Uh, so using voltage division, this is gonna look like 24 volts times four ohms over 14 ohms. which looks like 48 over seven volts or 
6.857 and some change volts. IL at infinity is just going to be VC at infinity divided by four ohms. So that's going to look like 48 over 28 or 12 over 7. which is 1.714 and some change amps. Um, since we know already that our circuit is under damped, we're ready to determine our response. So give me just a moment here to pull up the table that I made for you guys. All right, so in an under damp circuit, um, we know that our response is of the form, let's say that we're solving for um, the capacitor voltage and current, by the way. So we know that VC of T is of the form B1 cosine omega dT plus B2 sine omega dt e to the minus alpha t plus vc at infinity at t is zero plus this reduces down to b1 uh, because cosine of zero is one sine of zero is zero so this whole term here goes away e to the negative alpha t just looks like one. So we're gonna have b1 plus vc at infinity. Um, so from this, we can say that b1 is vc at zero plus minus vc at infinity. So that looks to me like 4.8 volts minus 48 over seven. Or negative 2.057 and some change volts. Our Capacitor current, IC of T is C dV by dT, which is going to look like C times omega dB2 minus alpha B1 cosine omega dT minus omega db1 plus alpha b2 sine omega dt e to the minus alpha t at t is equal to zero plus this reduces to c times omega db2 minus alpha B1. So since we already know what B1 is, we really just need to solve for B2. Um, so B2, let's see here, I'm going to have IC at zero plus divided by C plus alpha B1, and then I'm going to divide through by omega D. And so that is what I should get for B2. Uh, so I C at zero plus was 0 0.72 amps. C 
was 0 0.2 farads. Omega D was 1.392 per second. Alpha was 1.25. Per second, excuse me. Um, let's see, B1 was negative two point zero five seven volts. And omega D was once again 1.392 radians per second. So I'm just going to throw this in my calculator 0 0.72 divided by 0 0.2 times 1.392 plus 1.25 times negative 2.057. Divided by 1.392, I get B2 to be positive 0 0.739 volts and some change. From this, our capacitor voltage VC of T would be. Negative 2.057 cosine 1.392 T plus 0 0.739 sine 1.392 T E to the negative 1.25 T plus VC at infinity, which was. 6.857 volts. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simulate this circuit to see whether or not we are correct. So give me just a moment here. So I've got LT Spice up. Um, I'm going to create a new diagram here. I'm only going to look at the circuit during the transient condition, so I'm just going to replace that resistor R2 with a short. Uh, so here's the resistor R1. This was a 10 ohm resistor. Let me put my voltage source down here. 0.4. This is my four ohm resistor. This is my two Henry inductance. This is my 0 0.2 farad capacitance. Uh, I'm going to label this top node BC. I'm going to put ground at my bottommost node. So VC is at the positive polarity terminal of my capacitor. Uh, ground is at the negative polarity terminal of my capacitor, as I usually do. Um, I need to put my initial conditions on. So dot IC. Uh, the voltage at node VC is equal to, I believe it was 4.8 volts at T is equal to zero minus. And current flowing through my inductor I of L1 was 1.2 amps at T is equal to zero minus. 
throw these here. And let's see, simulate. So let's see, 1.25 per second. So let's do this for five seconds. We might need to adjust this here in a moment. Run our simulation. And we're going to look at our capacitor voltage. And this is what our capacitor voltage equation looks like. Um, I'm going to change this simulation time from five seconds to 10 seconds just to make sure that it's settling to a value. Yep, so it looks like it's settling to something uh, a little over 6.8. So that's good news because I believe we said that it should be 6.857 there. Yep. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to add traces. Okay. Um, so negative 2.057 times cosine of 1.392 um, times. So one thing that I do want to warn you guys about is that LT Spice um, uses degrees as its default angular unit, which means um, I need to make sure um, that I convert my angular frequency here of 1.392 radians per second into something in degrees per second. So I'm just going to multiply this by 180 over pi. That converts it from radians into degrees times time. Uh, let's see, plus 0 0.739 times sine times 1.392 times 180 over pi times time times exp of negative 1.25 times time plus 6.857, if my memory serves me correctly. Let's look here, yep. And my blue curve perfectly matches my green curve, which means a couple of different things. A, we did all of our, our excuse me, all of our analysis correctly, which that isn't really surprising because this circuit wasn't particularly hard to analyze. Uh, but B, it means that we set up our differential equation correctly, which is significantly more difficult to do. Um, so I would argue that if you work a general second order problem uh, and you're confident in your abilities to do all of the circuit analysis part, if your simulation does not match um, your analytical work, it's very likely because you made a mistake setting up your second order differential equation. Um, all right, so that's all I wanted to talk about for today. On our class meeting on Friday, we are going to work another second order general um, problem uh, where we're going to have two independent um, capacitors or two independent inductors and just see how that changes things. Uh, the short answer is it doesn't. All right, unless you have any questions, I will see you all on Friday.